the St. Thomas This call is uh, now being recorded. St. Thomas College to you. Without wasting much time, let's move ahead with the program. Now, we will be listening to the deliberation of Dr. Sham Shudhakar, an eminent poet and assistant professor of St. Thomas College Trishul. I would like to request our respected speaker to deliver his speech. Over to you, sir. Thank you, Sreya Sakha. <clears throat> Uh, good morning and welcome back to our session and um, today's session. Am I audible? Yeah. Yes, sir, you are audible. I'll, I'll do one thing. I'll put my earphones on so that just on. Hello. Uh, hello. Am I audible now? Yes. Yes, sir. You are. Yes, sir. Okay, good. So, uh, today's session is actually, as you know, is not a talk on a general theme, but uh, based on your syllabus. And uh, so. Uh, it is, I assume that it is for the degree students uh, of Sri Krishna College. And <clears throat> I'm going to talk about Victorian literature for the, uh, uh, for, the, for the first 10 or 15 minutes, and then move to this poem in specific, Alpha Tennyson's Ulysses. So we can have a textual analysis, that's the plan of the talk. <clears throat> so uh, maybe uh, what you can do is that in between, if you have any doubts, please, uh, please switch on your uh, earphones and then please speak in the middle of the talk so that we can uh, clear that and then go to the uh, talk, yeah, to the discussion. So uh, let me ask you one uh, simple question. What is Victorian literature or, uh, I mean, what is the period that we generally uh, say that this is Victorian literature? In, in English literature, we always uh, divide it in, 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 a, in a particular time span. So what is the time span that you know about Victorian literature? Can, can anyone switch on your mic and just speak to me? Approximately. It's uh, approximately 1850 to nine, 1900. Okay, excellent. Yeah, 1850 to 1900. Excellent. That's good. So now we have a time frame. So thank you, uh, Rimpa. Rimpa, right? Yeah. So. Uh, yeah, and now we have 1850 to 1900, that, that approximately, you said approximately. So you have used the word approximately. It's a beautiful word, actually, in English literature, because we don't have to be very specific about a particular time. Because, as we all know, no literature or no movement will open on the on the opening day, nine o'clock of a of a day, and we can say always say, okay, on this particular day, on uh, June 20, 22nd, this morning, Victorian literature begin opened. We cannot say like that because uh, it is actually a gradually every moment start with a with a gradual change, not just in literature but in society, in social, cultural, political, and a lot of events that has been take place and Victorian literature is of course a reflection of all those events. So that is how we place a literary text or generally maybe Victorian, the term Victorian such as Queen Victoria's uh, time span. So generally uh, uh, in, in a text like uh, Crompton Rickett's uh, History of English Literature or Edward Albert's uh, Literature, History of Literature or even David Deitch's uh, Literary History of Literature, uh, 
we have a uh, we have different time spans so uh, don't be upset with seeing different time spans it is approximately we said always approximately from 1850 uh, to 1900 maybe in some text you may see 1830 to 1901 or maybe 1832 that is i mean the uh, the beginning of reform bill 1832 or maybe in some texts you may see 1837 that is the assertion of queen victoria to throne so generally we say 1850 or 1830 to uh, 1900 so that is the time span now uh, it is it is more specific and uh, maybe to to subdivide uh, these these uh, big time span that is 70 years 1830 to 1900 we may divide it as early victorian mid victorian and late victorian we generally say early victorian as 18, 1848 till 1848 and then 1848 that is 1830 to 1848 is considered as early Victorian period. And 1848 to 1870 is considered as mid Victorian period. And later, the later Victorian is from 1870 to 1901. Okay. Sir. Yeah. Is early Victorian is also called high Victorian age? High Victorian, High Victorian is maybe a little more later. We can say the, the high modernity, that's a more, little later. Okay, so, uh, yeah, who are all the major writers or poets during that time? Major poets, I'm not going to talk about each and every poet, but there were several poets during that time. And uh, the major writers were uh, maybe our friend Alfred Tennyson, whom we are going to discuss, and then Robert Browning. Then Elizabeth Barrett Browning, we don't have to avoid women. Elizabeth Barrett Browning. Then uh, Matthew Arnold, of course, Matthew Arnold. Then uh, Christina Rossetti. Okay. Then maybe I don't know whether I should say the name of uh, Hopkins. Why I have a doubt? Because uh, Hopkins was discovered later in the 20th, 20th century. And then we consider Hopkins as a 20th century poet, though he lived during this time. Because his sensibility-wise, Hopkins has this 20th century sensibility, just like Blake has the sensibility of romantic, though he was born a little earlier than the, the high romantic poets. So Hopkins was uh, was like that. Later, uh, I think it was uh, Robert, um, what is his name? I forgot. Uh, somebody, somebody found out uh, this uh, Hopkins. Uh, Robert, um, okay, leave it, leave it. Okay. Uh, so, uh, and the major uh, essays were Thomas Carley, then John Ruskin, and of course Matthew Arnold, and Walter Peter. These are all the major essays. And novel was flourished during that time, and uh, Charlie by Charlie Bondi, Emily Bronte, then uh, Dickens, Charles Dickens, and Thackeray, W. M. Thackeray, then uh, Elizabeth Gaskell, then George Eliot, Anthony Trollope, then Thomas Hardy, Samuel Butler. There were quite a number of writers during that time, and also there were pre-Raphaelites and aestheticism and decadence and digitosity and all those writers. You know, there were there were always the on, on the forefront. So it was uh, a voice, I mean, different voices from from many sides, but some voices were, were, were bigger than the other. <clears throat> and this was the basic scene of Victorian era, we, when we generally see. And uh, industrialization was very much the, in England, and urbanism was uh, coming up, then so many new inventions, especially I'm talking about um, Darwin's uh, theory of evolution, and such things were happening. And Victorianism, uh, now I'm going to focus on two books actually, uh, Compton Ricketts and Edward Albert. And uh, Victorianism was, 
I mean, sorry, not Victorian, the Victorian era, the era of uh, the Victorian era uh, happened, as we, as we said, from 1800 to 1900, no, sorry, 1830 to 1900. And the major peculiarity of that particular era was most of them were against the wars in England. Because after this, this uh, so-called uh, French Revolution and after that bloodshed revolution and uh, the rise of Napoleon and then fall of Napoleon, all those things uh, made people believe something, made people in courts, where people believe uh, that we should not, I mean, uh, make any wars in our country. That's why I said people in people in course because England started making wars in all these colonies, but never during the Victorian period in in their country because they wanted to protect their country. So I mean, it was peaceful. It was a peaceful time except some some a few colonial wars during that time. So they were against war. <clears throat> so that you can I mean uh, such such interesting. Parts can be can be read in Edward Said's uh, book about I mean uh, essay about Jane Eyre. Maybe you can if you are interested, uh, you can inter interested you can read Edward Said's reading of Jane Eyre, where how this postcolonialism uh, the the the, post the I mean English English writers fail to see their own defects. I mean the uh, yeah. So the, the if you want to uh, know more about it, you may read Edward Said's. Uh, essay on Jane <clears throat> So, yeah, as we said, industrialization and mechanical development was um, coming up, and uh, this this uh, what is called the social condition of England was basically uh, about so many industries and industries are are, are coming up and labor uh, laborers were coming to England from different parts of the world and uh, they started making small uh, houses here and there and cities started coming up and there was cheap labor because there were multiple people started coming to England because of uh, I mean searching for jobs searching for a, a, a new what is called searching for the lack maybe and labor was cheap because so many people were coming from and uh, now, now it's happening in Kerala. Migration is happening in Kerala. So many people were coming, and this labor started um, a little. Uh, I mean, not uh, yeah. So, so it a little, a little cheap. So this labor became cheap, and then when the labor became cheap, what does it mean? Exploitation, nothing but exploitation. When you you started getting something, something for cheap that somebody is being exploited, right? So exploitation uh, was the, labor exploitation was the, and uh, then leisure, the idea of leisure started coming up because some people get leisure and some people will never get leisure. And then child labor was very much the, and uh, yeah, so uh, <clears throat> there was a kind of uh, disintegration of village community and so all such things were happening, and uh, it was a it was a time when the I mean Das capital uh, later I mean it is during the uh, during 1867 I think uh, the second volume of Das capital came, and because laborers were exploited on this side, it's not just in England but in several parts of the world, you know. So uh, such books were happening during this time and Communist Manifesto earlier, a little more earlier, I think it is in 1848 that Communist Manifesto came, I uh, mean, they published Communist Manifesto and later Das Capital in 1860, second volume uh, of Das Capital in 1867. And uh, it was during this time that the novel started coming up because all these men uh, were going to uh, of going for the workplace industries and then women ideally sitting in their home wanted something to read so basically i think when you say novel it is basically feminist in in its nature so it's for the women or by the men for the women it could be any way i mean uh, any anyhow you can read it in different ways and uh education the idea of education uh educational acts further and education became compulsory and reading started coming up with this novel as i as i said uh, re reading among common common people 
uh, that's not just you don't have to be very much educated or have to be uh, born in a particular class to read. Reading became a little more popular and public readings were happening and publication of cheap books were happening because of the, the uh, upcoming revolution of printing press and production multiplied because of major industries. As we said, uh, yeah, the industries were coming up, production multiplied, production of books multiplied, I mean, different copies. I mean, earlier it was not so. And limited copies were published, but now the, because of the industries and because of the machines mechanization, this this thing has coming up, and the press was of course a strong and a strong political force. Though uh, books such as Aeropagitica, I mean uh, by Milton, were published much earlier. I mean production of press became a a, a strong source, and it started. Uh, uh, pressing its hands on the minds of the people and people were started thinking in a new in new directions and uh, yeah so press became a strong political force just like social media became a strong political source in india now nowadays and journalism and novel writing were flourished <coughs> and it is at this time that Critics such as Edward Albert and several others talks about this Victorian compromise, the idea of Victorian compromise, because they were always caught up in, in two worlds. As we all know, the one is not, and it's it's a famous quote, one is uh, yet to be born and one is dead. Now, one, one world, this romantic era is dead and the other one, the, the, the modernist is yet to be born. So they are caught up in this, this, there, is a, there is always a paradox in, in this Victorian self. So that is why they say they say Victorian compromise. So uh, they have two worlds. One is dead and the other one yet to be formed. So uh, and all, always there is, there, is a, there is a compromise between science and religion. Science was coming up, up the, the, uh, with various inventions, especially of um, Charles Darwin, as we said earlier. Science was coming up, the idea of science, because uh, <clears throat> uh, it is during the time of enlightenment modernity that science started develop uh, develop in, in Europe, especially, yeah, uh, especially uh, the early proponents were uh, Francis Bacon and several others. And star science started coming up. Science, this idea of logic and method of study has become popular, and then the science came up. So earlier, the earlier religious beliefs were always there. So the 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 church, yeah. Sir, somebody wants to ask something. Lucky, Lucky Bar has raised. Lucky, you want to say something? Okay, I don't know. Okay, uh, so what is it telling you? Okay, okay, yeah. Uh, I think you press the that bar. Okay. Uh, that's fine. Uh, so, what was I telling you? Yeah, we were talking about this compromise, Victorian compromise, and uh, the struggle between these two, science and religion, because religion was still a powerful thing in Europe, and also when the science come up with its logic, religion couldn't uh, withstand such logical patterns. So, again, the science will ask, again, that, that idea is still there in India now, they will ask, I mean, some people will ask, I mean, uh, say God is there, and some people will ask, have you seen God? So there is always that, that friction happens uh, between, uh, I mean, it started during that time. And with the logic versus science. And <laughs> there is always a, a kind of compromise between aristocracy and democracy. Because aristocracy was the very much the were, which you can we can very well see in the in the later works uh, writers like D. S. Lawrence. I'm talking about that book, uh, Lady Chatterley's Love Work, where you can very well see the conflict between aristocracy and uh, this one, democracy. And also maybe you may see uh, you may read the work, um, the French Lieutenant's Woman. I'm talking about two. I I, I talk. Uh, as one modernist novel and one postmodern novel, French Lieutenant Woman. There is a movie called French Lieutenant Woman. If you uh, are interested in seeing a movie, you can see that one. <clears throat> but believe me, it's a boring movie. 
<laughs> I didn't like it personally because I love the book than the movie. So I recommend. I personally recommend the book. And uh, movie. I mean, it's like a three-hour movie, and you'll be tired. But if if you are too lazy to read a book, then you should read that novel. I'm uh, sorry. Uh, you should uh, see that movie. And uh, this this idea of social realism. was very much the because this class struggle and uh, writers started writing in realistic sense because novels are basically um, realistic during that time they started writing realistic novel and they reflected that is how uh, the traditional belief of literature that uh, li 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 belief of literary critics are important that they say literature is the mirror of life mirror of life means exactly what it is so this idea of realism started during this time and realism in novels and the democratic ideals were were always the that women were given uh, uh, political rights especially mrs browning was into this this political activities so women started I mean, earlier women were not given any political rights they were not considered as humans in in course so they started uh, i mean the, these people uh, started giving women political rights right to vote and all such things and there was the as i said the the development of science was very crucial during this time over uh, science and democracy and newspaper and printing magazines were developed and books were published multiple prints of books were published and especially the the ideas of uh, charles darwin i'm sure that you uh must be knowing about this his idea of uh theory of evolution that he strongly believed that and still we believe the science believe that our uh, earlier earlier people believe that our now uh, forefathers forefathers forefather must be adam and eve they uh, the god created them and they uh, they are in the uh, in the earth and they are because of some curse and then this guy called charles darwin actually he uh with his theory of evolution uh, he said that uh man i mean our forefathers forefather or forefathers forefather forefather was not adam or eve but a monkey so we started looking back and seeing our ancestor as a monkey so that was a that was a crucial uh, what is called change in the idea of human being till then we thought that this religion was everything or what our holy texts say was everything and we believed in all such things but then with the idea of experimentation religion couldn't prove anything of that way and this this science started developing and people started believing in science and uh, believe me the experience of maybe uh, a nun during that time who was 80 who strongly believed in god for his uh, i mean whole for her whole life and when she was 80 when she turned back all her life has become dust because then she she started realizing you imagine that all her life when she when she is 80 and now she believes in in religion and also uh, in science and when she looks back all her her life was a was a total waste a human being maybe maybe thinking in that way so that was that made a, a big dilemma in the in the minds of uh, victorian people the the uh, so yeah the the science was developing and this dilemma reflected on the three poets uh in different way three major poets in in three different ways first one uh matthew arnold second one uh robert browning and the third one um our friend alfred tennyson so uh on one side this modernism the idea of modernity and uh, experimentation and new technology science knowledge epistemological structures were developing and on the other side this religion the ancient religion and structures were there and matthew arnold with this change matthew arnold actually was the lamenting boy of 
English literature. He was, I mean, he was almost crying in his extra. For example, his poem Dower Beach. He says that uh, uh, he says that this melancholy. He talks about a melancholy of life, and that melancholic pattern that. Matthew Arnold says in even his in his articles, uh, or, uh, yeah, in his articles and his poems, definitely has this idea of pictorial compromise or that lamentation of of the past. And Browning was caught up in in the middle. Browning had a middle path, and Alfred Tennyson, on the other hand, actually started accepting all these uh, scientific inventions like to strive to seek and to find and not to eat i mean he, he just wanted to move away from from the so called uh, what is called the earlier uh, religious styles and patterns and then he wanted to experience something new so this poem can be this poem that we are going to talk can be read under this light that is i mean human beings are from from the traditional uh, what is called uh, I, i don't want to use the word darkness but the traditional notions without logic or or structures were uh, broken by this um, what is called uh, upcoming uh, authors upcoming writers and even scientists and alfred tennyson who has definitely who definitely has a scientific temperament easily could embrace the the Uh, the the freshness and freshness of the new era that is about to come. So Alfred Tennyson, though of course he has this this romantic burdens with him, and and he was never considered as a modernist because he still had that romantic burdens in him. But at the same time, he could uh, he could um, I mean drive his ship. To a, to a new direction that Matthew Arnold never wanted to. He was he was always a little skeptical, but this guy, our friend Matt uh, Tinson, was always optimistic. So on one side there are there is optimism, and on the one side there are there is uh, skepticism. So <clears throat> so that is why all these writers. Uh, were of course interested in the past, just like the their predecessors, romantic writers, and. especially when you when you go through the works of pre raphaelites they were interested in the paintings of middle ages of course browning's poem uh, antria del sarto frali polipi and several poems of um, this one um, his wife uh, mrs browning and uh, all, almost all the many many works of pre raphaelites were connected with this uh, middle ages the idea of middle ages and then kebel and new man i'm talking about that oxford movement during that time were based on this spiritual romanticism and walter pater and oscar wilde this this other side of aesthetic movement was always the and uh, they were against this idea of utilitarianism and this idea of pessimism during that time so people like tennyson now i think we can focus on um, tennyson's ulysses now i hope i got i gave you a, a basic idea about the uh, victorian era so if you have any any queries or anything may we may just quickly go through that and then we will uh, or straight away we can go go to the poem right we can yeah uh please take a text i'm going to read it sir yeah could you please explain what the victorian compromise actually is yeah it is a compromise between both the things i said i already said now it is a compromise actually what do you mean by the word compromise we are not completely into a particular thing but we make some compromise right we accept certain things that we are not okay with it completely but we make a compromise that's what compromise means and it is actually i as i told you the it is actually the the time that two worlds are the one one world is not is that that romantic spirit and all such things the, the the religious world and romantic world was dead and the the new world the complete scientific temperament world with the complete scientific temper temperament i'm talking about 20 20th century with lots of inventions with uh what is called uh, with machines mechanization with with electric trains and with even like 
computers or televisions. That in, in this century was I'm I'm so happy to be to tell you the truth. I'm so glad to be a part of 20th century because I never have seen such a huge century before. Such a such with lots of great inventions and yeah, with, with lots of dirtiness as well, of course. That two wars were happening, First World War and Second World War. Yeah. So uh, anyway, it was an eventful uh, century. And I don't know how many of you are born uh, in 20th century. If you are born in 20th century, it means that you're lucky. Uh, <clears throat> so, uh, yeah, you said you asked me compromise. So it is in between a compromise between science and religion. A compromise between democracy and aristocracy. So the that is a compromise that people make inside their mind, right? We we all we all know that certain things are wrong, but still we we practice it. Say say for instance, dowry in contemporary times. We all know we all say that dowry is 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 bad, but still, I mean there are still some some places where dowry is practiced. Do you agree with me? So people, people make that compromise to hold that tradition and also hold that tradition and culture and also they know what is the what is the reality, actual reality. Okay, there is always a kind Thank of you, sir. Okay. now it's clear. Thank you. So now shall I move on to the, the text? Ulysses by Alfred Tennyson. Uh, some people may pronounce this as Ulysses. That's that's okay. Indian. I mean, we can pronounce in whatever way we can be want. But actually, in Greece, I think they pronounce it as Ulysses. Uh, it little profits that an ideal king. By this still hearth among these barren cracks, matched with an aged wife, I met here and dole an equal loss to a savage race that hoard and sleep and feed and know not me. It's a it's a beautiful poem, I would say, because uh, the very line, see, it little profits, it little profits that an ideal king by the still hearth among these barren tracks matched with an aged wife. I met you and told Now he say I. So we know that somebody is speaking. A narrator is always there. It is not in a, written in a third person narrative, but somebody is speaking when he say I over there. So who is this I? That's what we are going to ask, the very question I. So we have a title, Ulysses. So this guy, Ulysses, is talking. Now we know that it is a monologue. It is, this, this poem is a dramatic monologue. And some may think that Ulysses is talking to us, we readers of 21st century, I mean, uh, having this online class and Ulysses is talking to us, maybe, or maybe his own mariners, he could talk to anyone. Anyway, he's talking, this man is talking. And that is, he's not just a man, but the, the great Ulysses. Ulysses, when Dante, and you know him, right, Dante? Yeah, Dante went to this place, uh, what is called Inferno. Virgil took him to, to see Mr. Ulysses. Virgil said, okay, Dante, he is Mr. Ulysses. And he has this great, what is called great throne. And he, because he has, he crossed, I mean, something beyond that the normal human being can cross. He has traveled. Yesterday we were we started our conversation with uh, Ulysses. He has traveled. He's a great traveler. So he he's not just like any other humans. He's not like you or me. He is sitting somewhere else. And Dante could meet him, and he said, "Hello, Ulysses. How are you?" And <clears throat> even in Homer's uh, work, I mean, the great Odyssey, uh, Tigris is suggested uh, this guy, Ulysses, not to not to go straight away to your, your country, man. You, you, should, you should roam around. You will. I know you will because I have seen life more than you, Mr. Ulysses, because I have been on this earth for quite a long time because of the curse and 
I thought that's a blessing, but later I knew that it was a curse. And Tyrus suggested Ulysses, I mean, don't do not to go home so early. You, you will, you will, even though if you wish to see your wife in a lobby or uh, Telemachus, you won't be able to because there are there are certain things called feet, and you will you will unite with the sea later. So now our friend Ulysses is old. He has gone back to his country after this Trojan War. He uh, had several experience. I mean, like. Uh, cyclopes and uh, competing with cyclopes and several, several, several people, several kings and several, several things. And now he's so rich. He has reached Ithaca and he's rich, rich with experience. Not that that Ithaca made him rich. I hope you have read that poem at least for uh, Siti Kawafi. It's there in the internet. And he has reached Ithaca and he uh, started ruling people. And now he's old. Yes, maybe you are you are seeing an old man with white beard, long beard, and he's so tired and so worn out. And now this man is talking to us in the in this 21st century. And he says, It little profits. There is no profit. It is useless, he says. It is useless. Oh, come on. You can can't you can't start a, a bomb like this. He says it is useless. The, the first line, we, we always have an idea of shubham, right? I mean, you should start something with something good. And then this man, see, this old man, but these old people doesn't have to do all those things because they are carefree and they know that all these beliefs and faiths are, are not relevant, but they have this scientific temperament always from, from their life. Maybe that is why he says, it little profits, it is useless that an idle king by this still hurt among these barren cracks. Yes, and an ideal king sitting next to a fire. By this still hurt among these barren cracks, those rocks, the uh, segment were there, and this old man. Now we can see a picture of an old man. And first we said an old man sitting, an ideal king. Now we know that he's an ideal king, a lazy, an ideal one. <coughs> And now the setting is clear. He's sitting by the still earth among these barren cracks and some cracks, barren rocks, uh, things are always there and some fire is there. And now he's sitting beside that fire like an old man sitting. Matched with an age five, oh my God, that is, I mean, he, he is old, though he's old. He says, okay, I'm, I'm sitting next to this old woman, matched with an aged wife. What to, what to say? It's a, it's a tragic situation, matched with an aged wife. I don't know whether he wants to have a, a chick beside him because he's, I mean, though he, he, he's, that is the basic spirit of an old man. See, matched with an aged wife, I met he and Dawn. I, I met he and Dawn. I just wanted to share, share certain things. I met he and Dawn. Unequal loss to a savage race. See, I met here and told. I just share things. Unequal loss to a savage race. Unequal or unequal. Unequal loss to a savage race. He's talking about people of Ithaca. And he says, he calls these people savage race, uncivilized race. Imagine that your teacher calls you uncivilized. How, how, uh, how difficult it will be for you to, to comprehend that. And this man is calling as a king, he's calling his whole race uncivilized. I don't know. He says, I don't want to, to talk to these uncivilized people. So uh, see, I, I, what am I doing? I just, I just bought certain things. I, maybe I will, I'll say, okay, this is good. And I give my uh, chain to them and then uh, somebody does something and then you, you punish them. And that's all a king can do. You either give some uh, something to satisfy people or then you punish them. And something to encourage people or you punish them. That's all kings do. So, uh, yeah. Uh, listen. Uh, what is it called? Yeah, an unequal loss to a savage race that hard and sleep and feed. Yeah, savage race. And why? I have a justification. He says, I have a justification that savage race, they hoard, they just, they just collect money or whatever. They hoard and sleep. 
they sleep and feed. Yes. Then it's almost like a like they are all epicureans. They eat, drink, and make money. They don't they don't do anything. And that they hoard. Yeah, they collect money. They may be materialistic. Too much of this idea of materialism, and they sleep and feed and know not me. And they don't know me and who I am. I'm a traveler. They have never traveled. They have never experienced an, another culture. And they don't know me, who I am. I cannot lose from travel. He says, so that is his problem. He says, I have a problem. I have a problem at this old age. Still, I'm old, but still, I have a problem. He says, because I cannot rush from travel. I, that, that, that travel, that country's civilization, they call me. I have a call and I cannot rush from travel. I will drink life to the least. I will drink life to the least. So I, I want to enjoy life. He, he just want to, he don't want to, want to, want to, he doesn't want to, what is called, I mean, move away from life or be to, to have a strict um, um, uh, practitioner of certain religion or certain cause, but he just want to enjoy everything. He says, I cannot rest from travel. I will drink, that drinking imagery, see, I will drink life to the least. And instead of, instead of life, it could be wine, but he never, that is the, the beauty of the poem. Even he said, I will drink life to the least. I want to come into the last drop. I just want to drink, drink this, this, maybe this is life. I don't want to drink the last drop. I mean, just drinking, when, when you say that last drop, you will, you will put your tongue inside that and you will take everything from it. That's drinking the life, just enjoy the life. And uh, see, these lines have a pattern. See? Uh, it little profits that an ideal king. So this this life, of course, has a pattern. As we said earlier, it is dramatic monologue written in iambic pentameter. Iambic pentameter. That every line has ten syllables. Let us see. It little profits that an ideal king. So see, ten syllables. By this still heard among these barren cracks. So ten syllables. So in that way, the whole poem is is rhyming, and also it is it has a rhyming pattern. Da 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 da. It is a rhyming pattern, and then uh, it is written in iambic pentameter with ten syllables, and also uh, it is written in a conversational style. So you you should say that it is written in blank verse. That is conversational style, and because of that conversational style. This, this uh, each sentence does not end with a line. He moves into the, that is, that is his poetic trick, technique. He, from one line, that, that idea never ends in just one line. He moves into the, in from one line, that 10th syllable, to the next. So that it, it becomes a conversational style, a pattern creates over them. And see, unequal loss to a savage race that hoard and sleep and feed and no, not me. I cannot rest from travel. I will drink life to the least. I will drink life to the least. All times I have enjoyed greatly, have suffered greatly. All these times I have enjoyed greatly, have suffered greatly. <laughs> so now he he's of the idea of seize the day. That is the time. You should enjoy the time. Seize the day. And he says, <clears throat> all these times I have all this time I have enjoyed greatly all these travels when I travel from uh, maybe in, in war, in Trojan war, yes, I have enjoyed the war, everything. I have enjoyed the good parts and bad things of the war. I have enjoyed my life greatly. Only an old man can say such a, such a, such a great comment. And that is, a, that is a very powerful statement. And no one will, will dare, much, no much people will dare to say that I have enjoyed my life greatly. Because there is always, and uh, as we know, Sophocles has famously, uh, utilitarianism, yes, of course, yes, of course, utilitarianism, the idea of utilitarianism is of course the, <clears throat> but not just things that we, we are using, he's actually rejecting the, the so-called idea of utilitarianism by saying that, People, they hoard and sleep, they hoard. Hoard means it is a rejection of utilitarianism. Okay. 
It is of course a is rejection of utilitarianism. This is this is something else to go beyond this utilitarianism. I mean, he's talking. He's a king, and he's not happy with. I mean, being a king, and who else can be more utilitarian and authoritarian than a king? And he says, "I reject all these things. I don't want all these things." There is something else. Something else is happening over there. So maybe it could be knowledge. It could be spiritual journey. Whatever it is, it is always there. And <clears throat> he says, um, "I have enjoyed greatly, have suffered greatly, both with those that loved me and alone." Yes, and I have traveled alone and with people, with those who loved me, my friends, my my people, or whether and alone, alone also on the shore when thou scudding drift the rainy haze that haze that five daughters of Atlas place by seas away from stars. Then those haze and scudding drifts of rainy haze vexed in dim sea and vexed and awed, vexed. In dim dim sea, that is that the sea is is not so calm. He he never because I mean that is a that's a metaphor of life, a powerful metaphor of life. That scudding drift of rainy haze vex the dim sea. I am become a name. It is a metaphor of life. That is I mean not so easy. Life is not a metamorphosis, and at the same time, life that that calls you to to something new. And I am become a name. I become a name. For always roaming with a hungry heart, yeah. For always roaming with a hungry heart, I'm just roaming in the world with a hungry heart. I wanted to know something new again and again that that my heart is hungry, and much have I seen and known. Much, much have I seen and known. It's not much have I seen or known. No, he says much have I seen and known. Many things I have known. Cities of men and manners, climates, councils, governments. Myself, not the least, but honored of them all. Everything I have seen, climates, different climates, different councils, different governments, and myself, not the least. And they all consider me as equal, never the least. And I was, but honored of them all. They all considered me because I'm Ulysses. Honored of them all, and and drunk again. This drinking metaphor. Is the and drunk delight to battle with my peers. Oh, okay. He's not talking about wine again. He's he's talking about drinking again. Delight of battle. Oh, that's a cruel image. And drunk the delight of battle with my peers, with my friends, with my peer community. Maybe the nobles of Ireland and people people with the same status. I mean, uh, peer groups. And <clears throat> Far on the ringing plain of Dinty Troy. Oh, that sounds he far on the ringing battle when he say battle and he says far on the ringing plain of Dinty Troy. Ringing that voice. Okay, so you can hear that, right? Far on the ringing plain of Dinty Troy. Now you can you can see the battling armors clash clash. That that sound ringing plain. See the word that is the apt word. Only poets can use that. The very apt word. See. For on the battle with the when the when the armors meet, that ringing plane. Ringing is not the right word, but here when Tennyson used that word, it becomes right. See, far on the ringing plane of windy Troy, I'm a part of all that I met. Yeah, armors clashes, and then I'm a part of all that I met. Everything, each and everything, not neither small or big. All that I took something, he says. I took something. I took something from everything I met. I never. My life is not a waste. I took it. I open myself to everything, each and everything that comes to me, and then I grabbed and everything. <laughs> Out of all that I met, I have met. Yet, yet all experiences and arts were no blames. Then till here he was high, and then he says yet. That's it. Down thing, and now his spirit is coming down because he's old man. He cannot do. Uh, I mean, he cannot be <coughs> what is called uh, in strength for a long time. Now he just. I think he's coming down when he used the word yet. Yet, all experience is an art. He's become philosophical. Maybe he is thinking about death, and he says yet, all experience is an art. Word to gleams. Means light. Light goes inside the arch. There is a big arch over the like the the door of the dead. 
the all experience is an ash gleam that untraveled world whose margin fades forever and forever when i move when i move further when the world the light is is through that ash i can see that there is an ash over there and when i move forward like a like a train moves forward to a tunnel and when i move forward and then that margin margin of the new found world fades when i when i when i think that okay i have experienced anything and everything of the world then still there are something else but the world is so big and no humans can can experience everything of this world it's vivid and ulysses perhaps is the is the one who who enjoyed most of the things and still he is not happy because he says there is something else that i have an experience there is something else far away and when i move further when i move go when i go there it moves further and further maybe like that you know he moves it moves further maybe one day it will come to him and margin fades and fades forever and forever when i move how dull i told you right he is becoming low his voice is becoming low and now he used the word dull how dull it is to pause to make an end maybe to death to die how dull it is to die to make a pause and yes it is because the life is so beautiful the life around us is so beautiful we can eat we can sleep and it is so beautiful we can talk to our friends it is so beautiful and he says how dull it is to pause to pause to experience i mean to experience all these things are so beautiful and how dull it is to pause i don't want to die i want to to drink life to the least i never want to die how dull it is to pause to make an end to rust unburnished or oh, to rust that word see that word rust why why is he was using that word rust because just now he used the word armor and he is talking about this one iron and then the rusting image is here how how dull it is to rust unburnished because they polish this as he said he's a great warrior and then every day they polish their armors that they they want to survive in the wars and now the word rust is really important here how dull it is to that's apt word to rust unburnished i mean not for for unpolished and then you can keep armors in the museums armors are not meant to keep in the museums armors are meant to meant to be the in the shine in the battlefield for a warrior and to rest unburnished not to shine in use as though to breath were life life piled on life multiple life life piled on life were all too little and of one to me little remains nothing little remains but every hour is saved from the eternal silence something more a, a bringer of new things and while it were for some three suns yeah he is talking about an eternal silence of course it is he mentions the idea of death or the some three suns some critic says that it is three years three suns to show and hold myself and this gray spirit yearning in desire this man old man this gray the hair is gray this gray hair the gray spirit gray spirit gray man is yearning in the desire desire to travel to follow knowledge like a sinking star yeah so ulysses is comparing himself with a sinking star he is a star and to to follow knowledge to follow the the new knowledge something new maybe the knowledge of the 20th century and to to follow that knowledge of of uh, what is called knowledge like a sinking star though he knows that he is getting old he's i mean slowly becoming a black hole this sinking star beyond the utmost bound of human thought yes beyond utmost bound humans may not may not be knowing something i mean all about death so beyond the utmost bound of human thought <clears throat> so he says this is my son my own telemachus he says okay now he is introducing his son so he, this is my son when someone comes to your home you say okay this is my but your parents say okay this is my son this is my daughter and in the same way he says this is my son 
mine own telemachus don't confuse don't have any confusions is mine own telemachus though you may think that i i was traveling all the way to troy and then uh, this odc and when i come back telemachus is the so do not think anything bad about my wife penelope he is quite sure he says he this is my son mine own telemachus to whom i leave the spect and i am Yes, all these kingly things. I will give all everything to this spect, and I'll to my own Telemachus. Well, loud of me. Yeah, don't think that I I don't love him. Though I know I was traveling, I was not here, but he was there always in my heart. I have given and I, I, I give him something, some well, loud of me. Desiring to fulfill, uh, fulfill this labor by slow prudence. He's good. He says he is good. So many critics were were a little critical about uh, this guy's Ulysses attitude towards his son. Uh, a little, he is looking uh, whether he is looking down upon this guy, uh, what is called Telemachus here, because he says he will do everything. He will do. He is good. When when a father says he is good to do all these things, and but I can't do that. I am I'm far above that. I mean, some critics. points out that ulysses has that kind of attitude <clears throat> so he says uh well loud of me yeah uh, yeah this this labor by slow this labor of the king labor of the king by slow prudence to make mild drug people and so make to give some uh, he has some patience to to make the the rough people or uncivilized people earlier he called them uncivilized directly and now a little indirect but yeah he says a uh, rough people and then he has the patience to to cut down the wings of the 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 rough people and <clears throat> through soft degrees so in a nice way he said through soft degrees maybe in a nice way he will do that he maybe he will advise them or else he will chop their fingers initially he won't cut their head directly he will do things nicely in soft degrees subdue them to the useful and the good yeah to subdue them make the i mean that is a kind of authoritarian sense maybe he will he will be able to manage the the kingdom properly <coughs> subdue them to useful and good most blameless is he the word most blameless he says i mean you cannot blame him and he he never say he is great no he is not saying that he say oh, most blameless is he most most blameless is he see the tone um <clears throat> centered in the sphere of common duties yeah <clears throat> yeah i think i have experienced this in my life when some of my relatives come to my house my parents i wanted my parents to say something good about me but they never said anything good about me maybe they couldn't find anything good about me so in the same way i now i can relate it with this most blameless is he centered in the spheres of common duties doesn't not to fail in office offices of gentleness and pay meet adoration to my household gods and he meet adoration he give appropriate appropriate uh, things or uh, substitute to uh, the household gods the small gods of uh, our our clan and when i am gone gone has two meaning when i am gone when i am when i am into travel and then god die when an old man says when i am gone it means when i am die and when ulysses says maybe when i go to go to the sea go to travel because this death imagery is frequently coming in this poem and you should understand one thing ulysses wrote this poem in 1833 uh when arthur hallam died so this poem was a reflection of the death of arthur hallam and the optimistic tone of this poem <coughs> as for many critics is of course uh, i mean telism was very close to arthur hallam and uh, close with uh, this guy his friend and when his close friend dies immediately he will have a kind of deep sorrow inside him but 
then he propagates like whatever it happened whatever happens i should go forward i should move further so he he's i mean trying to get all these optimistic spirit from everywhere and he says whatever happens maybe my close friend died i don't want to uh, uh be a boy of boy of full of boy full of tears but i just want to move forward so in that way also it is very it's a very personal poem. so <clears throat> what is it yeah when i'm gone he works he, he works telemachus he works his work i mine so he works his work i mine there lies the spot yeah he works uh, telemachus works his work telemachus will will rule the country and i will go I mind. There lies the port. The vessel puffs. So we can see that. So beautiful imagery over there. There lies the port. And you can see there, he says there. There lies the port. The vessel puffs her sail. There gloom the dark. So he sings uh, to somebody. The gloom the dark boat sees. My mariners. So he calls them. my mariners now we know who are all the audience direct audience now we know we are all the indirect audience of the narrator but there is a, a mentioning of the direct audience so he's this guy is talking to this king is talking to his his mariners there lies the port and the vessel puffs i mean the the, the ship over the 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 it, it is puffing the sail is puffing it's getting ready a merry any time it moves the sail puffs and i can see that the the gloom the dark yeah <clears throat> so uh, here the gloom the word gloom is is not noun but verb meaning appearing darkness dark appearing uh, appearing dark so the gloom the dark the gloom the dark broad seas my mariners soul that have that have toiled and wrote and thought and thought with me my mariners who who work hard who who sailed with me with all who have experienced all their of the all the toughness my dear friends my mariners that ever with a with a frolic welcome the welcome took the thunder and the sunshine and opposed free hearts free foreheads you and i are old yes what well, that 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 ever with a uh, with a with a fro frolic with the, the joke with a frolic welcome took the thunder and sunshine i i and opposed free hearts free foreheads we we have we we have took this this uh journey as a part of life just as a as a, a cracking joke or part of life we have experienced it with all our heart and this thunder we have experienced thunders and beautiful sunshine and opposed with opposed free heart free forehead you and i are old now we have done all those things once and now you and i we are old now old age has yet his honor and his toil yeah maybe you will get some respect when you are old you will get a seat in, when when you travel in a bus but it has its own problems as well when you when you go out you may any time fall down so old age has its own merits and demerits and old age has yet his honor and his toil death closes all yeah death will close everything it will stop everything that closes all but something er the end something er the end some work of noble note may yet be born again he is talking about death death closes all but still <clears throat> some sorry uh, but something er the end some work of noble note may yet be done not unbecoming men that strove with gods yes that he is talking about those those people against the will of god that that some people some men stood against the will of god with their will will power and some work noble note may yet be be done 
not becoming men that strove with gods. Yes, so he's talking about Trojan War again because the gods gods participated in that war. I mean, gods uh, some gods were with the with the Trojans and some uh, gods were with the Greeks and they fought. The night the lights begin to twinkle from the rocks. Now the lights begin to twinkle. Maybe he's talking about stars and maybe. Uh, Aries or Venus, etc. The stars are coming out slowly. The lights begin to twinkle from the rocks. The long day veins. The, the night has come. The day veins. The long day veins. The slow, it's, of course, day and night. Life and death. Day and night. So the long day veins. Slow moon climbs deeps. A slow moon, slow moon climbs. The moon climbs upon the sky. The deep mourns round with many voices. That is the the mourns again. That the idea of death comes in that word mourns. The morning mourns round with with many voices. Come, come, my friends. He is calling them. Again, he's proving that it's a dramatic monologue. Like he says, come, my friends, please come. It is not too late to seek a newer world. Please come, my friends. Though it is night, we are about to die, I know. We are old. But we still have some more, some more time. Maybe some, a few hours before the death. <clears throat> we still have something, something more. And it is too late, it is not too late to seek a newer world. Push off and, and sitting well in order, in order smite the, the surrounding furrows. Yes, to push off in the sea and to smite the surrounding furrows of the sea and to go, go beyond the sea, to cross the sea. For my purpose holds to sail beyond the sunset and bars of all the western stars just wanted to cross all the stars and to uh, to uh, to go somewhere where i can gain something more more knowledge until i die yeah until i die i don't want to want my those few hours before the death to be wasted i still wanted to to experience something new it may be that the girls will wash us down maybe the girls of the of the sea may wash us down or it may be we shall touch the happy isles. Maybe we shall touch that happy isles, or maybe we will be washed away by our because life is not a matter of roses, as I said. Good things are the bad things are the anything may come anytime. As we all know now in the corona times, life is random. It may happen anytime. But see, before we, we die, we should do something. We should enjoy our life. Again, that Epicurean sense is coming in tense, and I guess it may be that the girls will girls will wash away down, and maybe we shall touch the happy eyes and see the great Achilles. Yeah, that that great great Achilles. You will know all know who is Achilles, right? I mean, he's a great warrior, participated in the uh, in the Trojan War. This is a great warrior, and before uh, Ulysses, Achilles was the was in the forefront. And and see great Achilles, whom we we knew. Yeah, maybe this this Achilles. Maybe he he wanted to meet in the Happy Isles. We'll we maybe we'll go to heaven and see our friend Achilles. Maybe he's talking about this other Alum, because to go to heaven and see Alum over there, sitting over there, smiling at you. Then Faulkner, uh, uh, it's called. Uh, oh, uh, I forgot its title, uh, but it is actually a story of uh, a train, a train that takes you to the heaven. Well, uh, actually, there was a there was a signboard um, on the road, and then the there was some some mad people, mad guys, two mad guys were the called Shelley and Keats. They rode that signboard and made to the hell, made, made to the heaven. And then a boy, small boy, goes um, through that way and find a train. And this train, there, there is actually a literary train in the night. And this boy will go, go there, and there he meet Achilles with his shield. And he makes this boy sit on this this shield, and he walks through that 
uh, in their heaven and me i mean this boy will, will i mean uh, will be able to meet a lot of uh, great heroes of uh, homer uh, i forgot the title of the story but uh, that is a story <clears throat> mm. so yeah so and the achilles whom we we knew thou much is taken much abates and thou we are not now that strength which in old days yes much energy is taken much is taken much energy is taken and much abase and thou we are of whose no not <coughs> as as strong as we have started and with the old days moved earth and heaven we could when we were young we could move earth and heaven so easily it was we, we were we were the people who were fighting with gods and fighting against gods against the will of the youth even like we don't care and now we are old we know that we, we we lack our physical strength but still we have something else we have our will because we have that experience of traveling move the earth and heaven that which we are we are one equal temper of heroic hearts see we are all has one heart beats we are beating together one equal temper of heroic heart again he is getting stronger because he is showing that will will power one equal temper of heroic hearts because it's all it's almost like every beat they all these mariners beat at the same time their heart beats and one equal temper we we have the temperament of 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 traveling traveling across the world one equal temper of heroic heart hearts made weak by time we may be weak by time and faith but strong in will and we we may be maybe our our body may be weakened by time and and faith but strong in will we we have experiences and we have gained much from that experiences and we are strong in will to strive that famous line may be weak by time and faith but strong in will to strive to see to find and not to yield we still will strive will see seek and strive to seek and to find we'll find something and not to yield will never yield so this is that point <coughs> so uh <clears throat> shall we yeah go into discussion and actually you may i will do one thing i will uh give some notes materials to your head of the department maybe she will give you uh the materials and also i recommend some books for you uh actually i don't want to recommend uh, specific books because uh maybe in in our library it may be there and maybe it won't be there but please read some basics books on um uh, the history of literature and then maybe you can refer if you have that book david deitches is a good option the uh, the big volume maybe it, it earlier it, it came as four volumes and now i think it, it is coming as two volumes okay. yeah <clears throat> yeah uh, ma'am is it is it there in your library david deitches yeah we have david Oh, okay. That's great. So definitely, please refer to that book, A Critical History of English Literature by David Deitches. And the uh, you have a specific portion uh, for. Let's see. <clears throat> yeah, you have a specific portion for Victorian uh, literature in that book. And of course, there is a there is a book called Cambridge Companion to Victorian Poetry. You may write it down, Cambridge. companion to victorian poetry by joseph bristow i'm talking about general books cambridge companion to victorian poetry by joseph bristow or victorian poetry colon <coughs> poetry poetics and politics poetry poetics and politics by Isabel Armstrong, I S O B E L, Isabel Armstrong, and maybe you can refer uh, 
Harold Bloom's uh, Harold Bloom's critical views that the Bloom Bloom series. From there, you can definitely uh, please uh, read the bibliography and then read other books. You can refer Harold Bloom's critical views on Alfred Tennyson. He has written a, a, a book on Alfred Tennyson. And please refer that bibliography and then move to further books. And also, I'll tell you another book in specific, Alfred Tennyson, Colin, The Critical Legacy. Alfred Tennyson, The Critical Legacy by Lawrence Mazzino, M-A-Z-Z-E-N-O, Mazzino. <laughs> okay. And also, there is a beautiful book uh, edited by Christopher Ricks. Routledge has published that book. Christopher Ricks. See here, Christopher Ricks. R I C K S Ricks. It's a. It's actually an edited volume of Tennyson's poems with uh, explanations. With uh, and in that poem, you can you can always see like some lines echoing Shakespeare's, uh, Macbeth, and Hamlet. Please go through that. I will, I will give those materials to you so that you can uh, expand your horizon. Just like uh, Ulysses has done, you can expand your horizon into uh, uh, more references of uh, this particular form. Yeah, we have yeah okay. Okay, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's a, that's an important question, and I forgot to tell you that both are both are the same. Okay, Odysseus and uh, one is that Greek word, and then uh, when it translated into some other languages, both are both are the same same people, Odysseus and Ulysses. <coughs> Actually, it's pronounced as Ulysses. Ulysses. <coughs> There was another question. Ankita had asked okay. another question. Okay. Thank, Thank you very much, sir, for such an insightful session. The... Yeah. We are really mesmerized by your lecture. Let's now move ahead to the introduction. Wait a second. Somebody, uh, somebody has asked a question, it seems. Just a minute. Um, can we compare image of Ithaca with Wasteland? Okay, very well compare if you find uh, similarity. Image of Ithaca with Wasteland. And uh, yeah, yeah, of course, of course, of course. That's a beautiful idea, Ankita. Actually, I, I have never thought of that. You can very well because Ithaca is with a lot of people with utilitarian ideals. And Wasteland, of course, it is. Uh, a modernist view of that particular land, and yes, it can yeah, very well. That's a bit of an idea. Yeah, that is a, a wonderful idea. I would say, please do that and please write the paper on that. <clears throat> is there any questions? <laughs> Sir, uh, sir, sir, yes. sir, don't you think that Ulysses is a bit selfish? It's okay that he is thinking of enjoying life, but there are some responsibilities towards his family. Yeah, true, true, true. He is, I mean, several critics points out this idea. And also, uh, that is why this guy, you see, yeah, uh, that's a beautiful, uh, I mean, comment, uh, Ankita, and he's in hell. And that is why Dante has met him in hell, remember? It's yes, because, sir. Because of the same thing, that he hasn't done uh, things properly to his family, and then now he's in hell, and that's why Virgil took him to the, to uh, because he's there in the hell, no, though he got a special position in the hell, he's there in the hell with Lucifer, drinking with Lucifer. <laughs> <laughs> but he's very well there. And maybe I don't know whether Dante has seen Buddha because he also left his wife and child, right? So I hope Dante didn't meet Buddha there. Sir. 
Yes, hello. Uh, we can also say uh, in modern perspective, he is a, a representative of patriarchy also. Uh, how how do you how do you substantiate your idea? Um, because in yeah in literature we can, yeah we, we, we will have uh, so many ideas but how do we substantiate? Because our basic methodology is that we argue certain things and then we uh, what is called we draw examples right. That is how you should write. Uh, you should develop your your argument. That. Uh, <clears throat> You make an argument and then you start, you give uh, some some proofs to substantiate your your idea. So, what do you? How do you think this this particular thing? It's a beautiful thought. How do you think? Can you can you elaborate on that particular idea? So actually, uh, I was thinking it because of uh, he never uh, thought about his wife. Mm. Yeah. Maybe he could, he could take, but uh, he could take his old wife. But I think in the beginning of the poem, it is clear that he is not so happy with his aged wife. Otherwise, he would say happy matched with an with a wife. But he said matched with an aged wife. So I don't know whether poor Penelope. I hope she won't read this this poem by Tennyson and understand what her husband was doing all the time to her. Uh, Sir, yeah. There is another line uh, to follow knowledge like a sinking star. I couldn't understand uh, the metaphor sinking star clearly. Sinking stars, okay. <clears throat> sinking star, star could be a metaphor of, again, I mean, uh, his own that he is comparing himself to a sinking star. A sinking star means a star, I mean, that is uh, becoming a, a black hole, could be. I mean, so he doesn't. Uh, he's saying that maybe he, I mean, he's a star, of course, he's a star, but not a very bright star, but not a young star, but a sinking star. Slowly, it's moving towards death. Okay. And uh, we have a question uh, Happy Isles about uh, Karnadipa Chakrabati. Okay. Uh, happy Isles and how. Uh, they can meet with Achilles. Yeah, Achilles is very well there in Happy Isles. Maybe after after death, people go to his Happy Isles, and Achilles is dead in the uh, uh, death in the dead in the battlefield. Now he is very well there in the Happy Isles, and after death, these people will go there. Maybe when they when they go and go and go further, they reach the and then all these great barriers meet and. Again, that's a beautiful thing that again, like all the, the school friends meet and we make noise and uh, do that. Just like that, Ulysses wants to meet his friends, great friends, Achilles and uh, so many, so many people are the, uh, what are the other people? There are many, there are many in that, uh, uh, that section. Uh, yeah, so he wants to meet all, just like uh, I mean, some believe Hector that Hector and all. Yeah, Hector. Uh, of course, Hector. Achilles killed Hector. Mm. And Paris, even uh, Helen. Uh, and I mean, the, on the other side, Agamemnon and many, many others. Are there. Mm. So I don't think Ulysses wants to meet Agamemnon much. <laughs> but at the same time, yeah, <laughs> I don't think Ulysses wants to meet Agamemnon and then Poseidon. Never. <laughs> but there are, there are many others. Thank you sir. very much, sir. Thank you very much, sir, for this wonderful lecture. I, would, yes. I have a question. Um, in the line where it is said that to rushed and burnished, not to shine in use. Here, can we compare that uh, rushed and burnished means Ulysses is comparing to himself since uh, now he cannot, now he is not traveling and he is sitting there as a king. So, can he say that, that Ulysses exactly. is comparing this? Exactly, exactly, exactly. That's exactly what he's, he's trying to say. Because he's comparing himself to a uh, what is called piece of iron, and after some time, it will, if you keep it for a long time, it will rust. And if you polish it, then it will shine, just like an armor. Very sure. good. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Thank you, sir. 
we can also say that he is in old age so that's rust rust means that he he is old so he is of no use yes it is it's the same yeah he is of no no use now it is rusting keeping it you know on, on one side so the rust can be used as the same phrase as uh, age age and rust can be compared yes yes very well very well age and not in use not just aged but not in use as well <clears throat> unpolished right he is just sitting yes. sitting in his country rusting sir sir i have one more question yes. uh that line number 26 uh, if you could explain it once more uh i don't know i mean in my in, 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 hmm. but every hour is saved from that eternal silence something more a bringer of new things yeah it is about death that uh, uh every that arch right arch and then he you, you uh, move forward right that image because i don't have the number uh, i mean line number in my text but you i mean can you read that that line yes uh, but every hour is saved from that eternal silence something more a bringer of new things and while it were for some three suns to store and hold myself yeah 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 it is about that death and life come i mean the con uh, the contrast of death and life and this eternal silence is nothing i mean it's still so clear it is eternal silence is death because we yeah we 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 have sleep as a as a small drop of death and then in the it's like later we die okay sir i understand now thank you thank you sir yes don't you think that ulysses has called her wife aged just not because of her physical age because her mental age she is not matching his spirit yes yes <laughs> that is true <laughs> i don't want to uh, make much comment on that because i mean <laughs> i don't want penelope in the heaven to watch this this online class and make commands on ulysses but of course i think this old man is doing that <laughs> and don't you think it there is a there is a fashion of men condemning their wife even now right in social media and men says i mean something about marriage and their wife is like they are they are uh, what is called they are in the like they are in the prison in the love marriage is a kind of prison for men it is always like uh, yes sir yeah so that should be read with the light in under the light of feminism <laughs> that such comments right and men will always that is of course a, a a a linguistic play of patriarchy yes sir thank you well uh, hello sham uh, yeah hello can you hear me yes sir this is good yeah well actually it's been a wonderful journey you know uh, thank you i didn't you know we are so badly confined within the four walls and because of pandemic time and uh, so was ulysses you know in yeah. the circumstances he was also confined but uh, uh, the journey that you have taken us all the way across the poem it's been so wonderfully reach you know mm. now the question that i'm having in my mind and, and, and another point i'd like to share with you that you know the influx of questions you know that is flooding Uh, that also indicates students our students how deeply they have been engaged all through the discussion you know? yeah absolutely. now i can Nobody. see i can see someone asked but the uh, philosophy tennyson shared his poetic uh, philosophy through his uh, career and how can you connect it with the postmodern era right. right yeah there are two questions yeah i mean uh, yeah you were you were about to say something yes uh, what i was i was going to say is that you know uh, when this poem was written that time tennyson was just 24 years old mm -hmm. that really puzzles me that you know uh, that a, a man of just 24 years old you know is writing a poem is full, so rich you know so you know so loaded with you know uh, uh, 
uh, the philosophical experiences of an old man and you know, almost i think it is being written by a man who is maybe 80 plus age you know so but he is just 24 years old so yeah. you are also a poet you know and uh, you also sometimes write uh, uh, something not uh, out of your own you know standing in life you know so what i want to ask you is that the sensitivity is required to compose a to compose a poem when when the the speaker doesn't match the age of the poet you know i mean you know how is it possible for a poet to to position himself in such a you know situation when he's speaking uh, almost like a man of 8 years old a man who is having this much of an you know, loaded experience of life you know that really confuses me how do you look at the issue i think uh, sensibility right sensibility will never uh, come by age i have met so many people i know so many people even when they are 80 they will fight for their material things you know such people right you also know yeah. such people right and even like before that five minutes before that they fight for uh, maybe five acres of land or just right. uh, half acre of land as if they are going to do something over there mm. <laughs> so i think uh, age doesn't matter it's, it's actually basically how we are open to the to the world and of course in in tennyson he is not just tennyson he is lord tennyson and he was rich and he could uh, <laughs> buy books and experience i mean he has i mean uh, when he was 24 i think he has uh, read dante's uh, divine comedy and several books of uh, because he was exposed to uh, to history why i said rich because he is not living in the uh, in the 21st century when we can it's easy for us to to get a book in a, a greek mythology online or even when we go to the library but during that time, imagine how difficult it was absolutely, for absolutely. people to go to library or maybe they must have traveled for hours or days to find a, just a single book. Right. Mm. Yeah, so I think uh, that is that matters, actually. Such things matter. The availability of books matters. And also the availability of knowledge matters. And in that way, we can very well say that this guy was privileged, but no harm he can be. And mm. then he has used it, used it for the betterment of the world. That matters. Mm. Another aspect you know, that you know, uh, I would say shocked me is that you know, when Arthur Hallam died, he was just 22 years old. You know, mm -hmm. and uh, the friendship was not that long. You know, in terms of years. You know? But he was yeah. deeply sad, and no doubt about that. Now, actually, being moved by the sudden death of his friend Arthur Hallam. Many critics suggest that this poem was written, mm -hmm. but this poem talks about the I would say, celebration of life. It is a pro-life poem, you know, and death is there, but death has been taken in in the in the way to celebrate life, you know. So how do uh, how do you know uh, uh, what should I say? Visualize the issue that you know he is being driven by the idea of death of his very bosom friend, you know, Arthur Hallam, and uh, being driven by the idea. Of Death. He's going to celebrate the life, the celebration of life. He's, you know, uh, he's, you know, uh, inaugurating the celebration of life in this poem. Uh, I'm not sure whether I understood your question uh, completely, but I'll, 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 I'll try to answer. And if I'm not answering you properly, please uh, let me know. I think uh, that this man, uh, Tennyson, like after the death of his close friends, he just wanted to uh, think that. He, he don't, I mean, uh, say for instance, my friend died and mm. immediately I have a tendency to, to lament or cry or uh, I'll be sad. But Tennyson is, is just holding that thing and he's thinking about the philosophy that, we, uh, I mean, a greater philosophy that life never ends here. We can go to the as happy isles and meet that friend again. This is a small time span in this world and we will again go because this life and death are all in one travel it is not that life is just one travel and it ends by death 
he's saying that that travel again and another travel begins after that so he's moving across the the life death uh, what is called that uh, loop yes yes i mean you mean to say that you know life and death they are inseparable you know? and uh, yeah, when yes. somebody is going to talk about life the idea of it has to be there as well so it yes, comes yes. he may, he may have been motivated by the by the loss is a you know, great loss uh, in the form of you know, losing his friend but that may have motivated him to think about life in a, in a broader perspective you know? yes 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 i think that is uh, i mean uh, especially for indians uh, we our time span is bigger actually i had an experience when i uh, had a reading in uh, in sydney uh, uh, some years back uh, Uh, if, if a writer asks me, "What do you? How do you write about certain things, or how do you conceive certain things which is beyond history?" Right. So that was the question. And when an Australian asks beyond history, imagine that Australia's history has a limit. History means written history right. has has their own limits. But as an Indian, like our our history, we we don't know. I mean, our history is mixed with myths. and legends and stories when we go Absolutely. back Absolutely. so so nothing because for an indian indian idea of time is totally different from a, a western and australian's idea of time it is much open indian you know position is much open yes 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 or the time never ends it is again like a loop or something right mm. right right yeah <laughs> thank you so much it's been such a rewarding experience you know listening uh, one of the greatest poems ever written in english language you know being explained by one of the modern poets of india you know it's such a wonderful experience thank you so much okay, thank you so we have a couple of more questions uh, so we can uh, sorry um, <coughs> yeah again uh, and yesterday i some somebody asked me on uh, facebook messenger a, a beautiful question after our our session about the uh, what is called uh, about our Uh, the, the the three videos that i uh, showed you yesterday <clears throat> and now we will we we'll go to the other question and tennyson shared his poetic philosophy through uh, the character of ulysses yes of course that's right tennyson of course shared the poetic his poetic philosophy or the philosophy of his own life uh, through the character of ulysses mm -hmm. and so how can we interpret uh, ulysses in postmodern era okay uh, yeah i mean forget about postmodernism even we can do it in the present because he is talking about uh, i mean an ideal place that we are now and i was thinking about placing tennyson in the era of pandemic that we are all closed and we always wanted to strive to seek and to find not to eat and we are striving but we are not able to move so i think we can place this this poem the grand philosophy anywhere and everywhere uh so we can uh, so we can we can be say we can meet 15 year old man and a boy i don't i didn't understand boy 35 i didn't understand that question uh sunanda devi can you yeah uh, sir actually yeah. uh, shubhoto sir was asking about tennyson's age and his experiences uh, since uh, how can he gain so much experience in a short life oh, okay, okay, okay. so that's why i, I asked that uh, experience means as uh, experience makes us uh, uh, knowledgeable not the age so uh, a old uh, a older age doesn't mean that he is much more experienced Exactly, exactly, exactly. Yes, that's what I was trying to say. Mm. Because I know people, I mean, who are eighty or something, who are foolish to tell you the truth. And some, uh, uh, you know, once I had a strange experience from a uh, Vivekananda Ilam in in Chennai. Mm. I I plucked a flower from a from a tree. I, there was a beautiful tree, and I plucked a flower, and I smelled it. and then immediately a small boy of uh, i was some 23 or something during that time 23 24 and i plucked a flower i i was i, I washed all those things and then i i was coming out there was a small tree and i plucked a flower from that tree and i smelled it and then immediately like a 
uh, what is called like a miracle boy just appeared in front of me and then this boy asked me like why did you pluck that flower and i said i just plucked it <laughs> what happened I'm sorry and i just looked around and there was no uh, board saying that do not pluck the flower so i told him like you should uh, put a board over here and he said that if you pluck that flower how long will you keep that flower with you and if it were on the tree maybe the next person could smell it could touch it but you have plucked it and how long will you keep that flower with you maybe maximum half an hour and after that you will throw it away then i thought okay <laughs> i was ashamed actually to tell you the truth i felt really bad for doing it i just said i'm really sorry and he said okay just go i said okay i realized my mistake so there are people who will teach us when i mean even though they are young of course there are some and i have learned from several students of mine i think we should i mean even like you should keep yourself open to the young people as well not just the elderly ones i mean you'll get that is why ulysses says like my life was never he says in one place i i i have uh, what is called somewhere i have i have been from everything each and everything that i have met right either young or old uh, okay yeah Ka kanadiba chakravarti is asking chakravarti is asking queries about some poet please composed by you oh yeah of course uh, yes of course you can ask hmm. uh, ankita is saying so uh, we can say that this world of uh, existential crisis um, is like a solution to get out of depression okay so um, yes this world means the the uh, contemporary world right yes contemporary world yeah existential crisis is always the but <clears throat> um, maybe uh, i think you should read soren kierkegaard and uh, to know much more about this existential crisis and the ideas because uh, that we cannot say it in a, in a, in just one or two sentences but maybe you can refer to the idea of leap into faith the idea of leap into faith that you should i mean how you escape from that existential crisis or certain realities by by putting ourselves into into certain realities but later critics post structuralist critics like derrida and some many others said that that is also a kind of you know suicide so uh, maybe you can refer uh, such works as existentialism yeah so kannadi bachakravarti you want to uh, say something hello sir ah uh, hello hello sanun sir i have read many of your poems like the green sun dew sir like this many but mm -hmm. sir poem waiting i can't understand the meaning of this poem waiting sir please can you explain this poem waiting okay then i should also check waiting 47 yeah <clears throat> waiting none waiting in this railway station knows of his yesterday he waits for the train with hope i'll read it once again waiting none waiting in this railway station knows of his yesterday he waits for the train with hope did you understand now sir no, please uh, explain sir this okay i will i will read it once again waiting that waiting you understood the meaning right waiting yes sir none waiting in this railway station this railway station and none in the waiting in this railway station knows of his yesterday what has happened to him yesterday in this railway station we are all sitting and none among us waiting in this railway station knows of his yesterday he waits for the train with hope 
Now, did you understand? Sir, a little, little. Little, yeah. Again, shall I read you, read it for you once again? Yes, sir. Please, again. <laughs> no, I mean it's actually. Uh, I uh, when we say none waiting in this railway station because uh, in a crowd we don't know what is going to happen next, right? In a railway station, you have been to a railway station, right? There are many people just like us in that railway station, and all I mean, they all have minds and relatives and friends and lovers and family, friends and uh, their own stories, and they all have that. So they are all individual by themselves, but we don't we don't think about it. And none in this railway station knows of his yesterday. Maybe he's a random stranger over there, and he waits for the train with hope, with hope, with hope of what? Maybe he's waiting for his um, uh, his lover to come. Maybe somebody is coming in that train. His long lost parents maybe the, or maybe to commit suicide. He just wanted to jump in front of the train and to commit suicide. Maybe that's that he's waiting, and we don't know what will happen next. So, the space. Uh, this is the this is a book, and the space under that book has that meaning. Please go read through that space, then you will understand. What do you want to understand from that poem? It's important. Don't don't. I mean, that's exactly what I tell you. If you want to want him to jump in front of the train. Then let him jump, and yes, if you do, yeah. And if you want him to meet his parents or his long lost parents, or or maybe his, uh, I mean, so his friend is coming, his lover is coming, and then let them come. Yes, sir. Now it is clear he is yeah. waiting for his unknown future. What happened? He did not. Yeah. He doesn't. Yeah, could be. Could be. Yes, yeah. Sir. Yeah. Maybe he can. He can immediately when the train comes. He can immediately jump, and he can be free from all his sufferings. Yes, sir. Okay. So, sir, one more. Yeah. So, the poem, the prayer. There is a line, deliberately forgetting to return. The sinking boatman plucked a rainbow. Yeah. So, this line I can't. The sinking boatman. Plucked a rainbow. Sir, what is the significance of plucked a rainbow? Okay, first I thank you for reading those poems so carefully. Mm -hmm. That's an, <laughs> that is that is I'm I'm so happy actually you have uh, okay. taken pain to read the poems. Yeah. <laughs> uh, which poem is that? Mm, what is the title of the poem? The prayer. The prayer. And uh, people do the prayer, yeah, not twenty five. Yeah, so <clears throat> deliberately forgetting to return, the sinking boatman plucked the rainbow, mm -hmm. put it in the. Uh, I don't know why you stuck in this form. But when my Tamil translation, the Tamil book has come, they put this form, this particular form, as the the first form of that book. Uh, when I published my Malayalam collection, uh, this form was there in Malayalam, and I didn't give this form much importance, and I I, I just placed it in the middle of part of the book because I thought that this is an average form. But when it got translated into Tamil, they uh, they captured this poem and they said, "Okay, this is an important one, and we uh, put it uh, in the front." I mean, that was the first poem. So it's basically deliberately forgetting to return. The thinking boatman plucked the rainbow. I mean, he can the thinking boatman. He is thinking. The boat is thinking. The boatman is thinking, and the rainbow is of this shape. And he plucked the rainbow and then put it in the put it uh, put it in the water face up. He just wanted to put it in the water, face up, so that it will become an another boat, face up, and pleaded for an oar. He just wanted to have an oar, and to whom? From the anonymous captain of the wreck ship. There is an anonymous captain of the wreck ship over right before him. He is seeing, and another ship 
is uh, is rut and that captain is also having the same problem but he just initially he plucked it and he placed it and he made a boat of that that rainbow and then he is asking that captain he's also going to die so that is someone here and he's also going to die and then he's asking that that captain to to give him an oar yes sir now i can understand the meaning thank you sir sir one more no i said i just said the the just one meaning okay <laughs> okay there are there are if you if you dig more you can you can go further don't uh, don't just place a poem in in into just a single meaning just now we 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 said this this poem citizens poem is important in in post modern era in the era of covid or even in the era of uh, see the, the the time span that that poem has that from we started talking from the time of elizas and dandes thing and then victorian time and even post modern time modern time and then even the present so the the time span of a poem and we can place it 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 in different ways somebody is asking railway station is the life of us yes it could be <clears throat> i mean such poems are open actually not closed that the poems are basically open you can take your own what you feel is important that is why exactly that yesterday i i, I told you right i had a beautiful question i got a beautiful question from uh, one of the person who attended this uh, 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 yesterday's lecture the question was like this yesterday i showed you three visuals of three poems and the second poem was horrible and um, that person couldn't couldn't watch it completely because i mean she just wanted to uh, that to finish it off because it was a little irritating that the second one and the first one was smooth and the last one was also smooth so the idea was that the second one conveyed its message because that poem was basically about the mind of a person who is going to commit suicide and he is not able to that person that yeah, whenever he tries somebody disturbs whenever he tries to commit suicide somebody disturbs and the poem is basically about this uh, i mean the media coming to us our life and we are not free we don't uh, we are not able to think about ourselves think for ourselves or we are always trapped in certain uh, certain things around and people are we are though we are alone in the crowd the crowd is always bringing us into that and we are we are we don't get our own time so that was the basic idea of that poem and of course the 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 theme of the poem is disturbance so if the visuals also disturb you then i should tell the director of that thing that is a it's a success because it is meant to create that kind of a disturbance so uh, poetry is not always for i um, mean to soothe your life or this thing to create disturbance as well disturbance is also a feeling so that kind of friction right something to 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 uh, what is called um, to play with your mind and the heart is always a, as an uh, is one of the aims of poetry yeah somebody is saying we don't know what happened to the next moment in the life yes that is that is exactly what's happening in the railway station we don't know because i have seen in the railway station uh, so many people uh, waiting for the train and then falling down when the train comes with a heart attack and people run over that person we are living in india and you you should read jainta mahapatra and i have seen people scolding the train drunk guards in front right standing right in front of the train and scolding the train for for sir many things and the train just looks at them with that big eyes i seen people like doing like that in india india is a, it's a wonderful place we can see a lot of things here <laughs> sir hello yeah mm. sir you want one more poem circles sir in this poem what Which is one? the 
cast out a black circle which one which one circles circles which circle page 30 39 37 yeah circles yeah a black circle in a plane sphere struck him waves may come any time so can you tell me what you you got from that form what image or what feeling that you got from that that form sir i i can't i can't imagine the form black circle in the plane first i can okay sir can't imagine that <laughs> okay then then just leave it that is that that form is is not for you just leave it <laughs> actually uh, no there are uh, it could be a, a uh, what is called a small trajectory just like we we make a small circle and arrows were just passing to that particular thing or else a small boy standing in the midst of a of field or sea like the the vast space over that and a small drop a single thing is is right over the in the sea alone in the sea or alone in the crowd it could be a waves may come any time that is fear he is always the in the vastness and you are in the uh, when you are struck with corona and death is everywhere anywhere and you are in the midst i mean it is like a small drop and you always have that fear and it may come any time but you don't know whether it will come or not okay sir now i can understand <laughs> yeah, thank you thank you, thank you so, <coughs> so if there are no Maybe cases then question? from anybody yeah. Yeah, we should respect their hunger as well, because it is one thirty and so they will be hungry. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, there is no more questions. Then wind up. Yeah, we'll wind up. Anyone wants to ask anything more? Hamka, is there any questions? Anyone? Hello, sir. Ah, uh, hello. Thank you for this wonderful lecture. In your poem, identity. What is the meaning of Nina Kom Parra? My first line, sir. Identity. Yes, sir. Just a minute. In your poem, first line. Mm. Identity twenty nine. Oh, okay, <laughs> okay. Uh, Red Nicanor Parra is a poet. Nicanor Parra is a uh, is a Latin American poet. Hmm? Please Google Nicanor Parra. You have an assignment. Please Google Nicanor Parra and at least read some two or three poems of him. He's a beautiful poet, wonderful poet. Hmm? And this poem is a a mirror of Nicanor's for Nicanor Parra's poem. There is a poem by Nicanor Parra called Poems to Pope. Okay, it's a political poem. Poems to Pope. that's the title of that poem and this poem is structured like poems of pope almost used i mean several images and style the very style of this particular poem is uh, it's actually a, a an uh, imitation of nicanor parra's poem so it's i i i wrote this poem after reading nicanor parra so that is why nicanor parra i mean you please uh, Read Nicanor Parra. He's a Latin American poet. Just Google his name, and you will find out several poems. A very interesting poet. He is from the generation after this Pablo Neruda, the the poets who sing. There were a, a generation of poets who can sing, like Neruda and Lorca and all those people. But he was against this idea of singing, and he wanted to say things to people. Yeah. Do we have any more questions? Then Rimpa can take over. If you don't 
Thank you, sir. Thank you so much for such an informative session. Yeah, thank you. No, I, I also enjoyed you. I mean, being with you. <laughs> yeah, I also enjoyed being with you because there were. Uh, yeah, I don't know how to say that because it is superb. <laughs> you you guys were super because you some of you have read the text and then came up with beautiful questions. And also, I enjoy teaching you in. I mean. This this particular poem and talking to you about time. We were. It's not like teaching you or it is like talking to you. So it makes more sense. So your discussion are really great. Yeah, I also enjoyed it greatly. <laughs> yeah. Okay, sir. Now I would request Onkita Shaha to give the uh, vote of thanks. Over to you, Onkita. A very good afternoon to all. As all good things comes to an end, so does our today's lecture series organized by Sri Krishna College Bogola in collaboration with St. Thomas College Teacher Kerala. I feel immense pleasure to propose a vote of thanks on the behalf of the Department of English of Sri Krishna College and its entire fraternity. First of all, I want to express my sincere gratitude to Dr. Sham Shudakar, an eminent poet and the assistant professor of Department of English, St. Thomas College Fisher, who spared his precious time from his busy schedule to grace this occasion and enlighten all of us with his innovative ideas on poetry reading and his appreciation. Thank you so much, sir. It was really a great session. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Please stay healthy, all of you. I would further extend the hearty thanks to our principal, Sir Dr. Shukdev Khosh, for his unfaltering support. He is the backbone of our college and the guiding force for every new step forward. Next, I would take this opportunity to express my deep regards to our HOD ma'am, Professor Anamika Chakraborty, who is the sole person behind this program and a constant motivator to all of us. Thank you. Then, I would like to thank our program coordinator. Professor Ronit Mondol, who is a guiding force in all our activities to excel in the field of education. Next, I'd thank like you. to thank. Next, I'd like to thank all the teachers of our department who directly or indirectly helped us to conduct this program. Last but not the least, my deep sense of thanks to all the participants who attended this lecture series with great enthusiasm and made today's event a great success. Thank you all for being with us. Have a nice day ahead. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. So, really? so we can leave now, I think. Yeah.